I guess I'll, I'll kick us off here. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, um, uh, Imran, thank you so much for uh, jumping on here uh, with us today. Um, Imran Siddiqui is a Democratic uh, congressional candidate uh, from the state of Washington in Washington's um, 8th Congressional District running against uh, sitting Congresswoman Kim Schreier. Um, he served as the, I think it's the chairperson of Washington Care for the past three years. Um, he's a nationally known uh, advocate, uh, community leader. Um, and uh, Imran, why don't, you, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you you jumped into the race and, and then I'll let Salam take it from there. Yeah, um, great to, to be here with you all. And, um, you know, came in for a variety of reasons. Obviously, the situation, uh, you know, with, with Gaza, I think, hits close to home for, for many people in our community. Uh, my brother-in-law is from Gaza, so, you know, he's lost many of his family members uh, during this bombing campaign and uh, during the 2014 bombing campaign as well. So for me, it's something that, that definitely... You know, it hurts to to see what's happening for all as for all of us. And so, um, you know, moving to Washington in 2020, I was in Arizona previously from 2005 to 2020. I I ran the care chapter uh, over there for many years. I was also a small business owner uh, in Arizona. I started a coffee shop, which is still going, um, and you know, multiple other businesses. But I also was passionate about the civil rights aspect and, and jumped in as a, as a volunteer board member with the care chapter over there, um, eventually building it up, you know, because it took up so much of my time, I essentially became the executive director. And, you know, thankfully it, it became a, a pretty strong force. And I, I started a lot of, you know, globally renowned campaigns out of that, uh, out of that uh, position. I took the job in 2020 uh, with a little bit of a larger chapter here in Washington State. I just thought it would be a, a good move for uh, a, a larger organization and a more sort of welcoming environment for uh, the advocacy that I do. And so it just so happens that I moved into Congressional District 8 when I took the job over here. It was right during the pandemic. And it was a beautiful place, Sammamish, Washington, great place to raise your family. Uh, you know, really diverse area. It's close to a lot of massage, uh, really bustling Muslim community, South Asian, Asian communities that are there. Um, but as we sort of transitioned into those election seasons, uh, we were sort of implored to, you know, have the back of somebody like Kim Schreier, who was, who was uh, you know, a Democrat that, that was elected in 2018. Um, so a lot of us turned out for her um, in, in these elections in 2020 and 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, but during the times when you needed her, uh, unfortunately, it has not been the greatest, especially for the Muslim community and people who are directly impacted by what's happening in Palestine. And so a lot of these votes uh, that have taken place in these last nine, 10 months uh, specifically have been really just troubling um, in terms of centering her own Democratic colleague in terms of defunding UNRWA in terms of, uh, you know, criminalizing the International Criminal Court, uh, challenging the death toll numbers from the Gaza Health Ministry. These are just things that we don't want to see out of our elected officials. And it really speaks to the fact that what are, what are our elected officials doing during this time? So for me, as a, as a matter of principle, as somebody who's sat across the desk from these these Congress people, uh, imploring them to to recognize our humanity and to really do anything to to stop the bombing, uh, it it just spoke to me that I needed to stand up. I would have supported really anybody uh, who uh, of the same sort of principle that would have stood up against her. However. Uh, nobody stood up, and so I decided to make that jump, and so here we yeah. are. If not you, then who? And if not now, then when? Exactly. Um, you know, you've raised an, a very impressive uh, three hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars for the campaign. That that's quite um, an accomplishment for a relatively unknown uh, candidate. Uh, how how'd you do that? Who 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 did you organize with or? Yeah, I think it's it's it speaks to uh, the it's not just the Muslim community, but I think it does reflect uh, the strength of our community. I think we oftentimes find ourselves in the paradigm of, oh, APAC is spending twenty five million dollars or seven million dollars. But 
as you see in this, there was just a Seattle Times article yesterday that, that mentioned me that I raised the second highest amount of any non-incumbent. And I had only a month and a half to do it during that quarter. So probably first highest, if you really take that into account, it's really just people who are motivated to see that, to, to see that somebody is willing to take it to, uh, you know, sort of the dark money lobbies that are out there, such as APAC. And it's not just limited to them. It's whether it's corporate interest, whether it's any other foreign entity that's trying to influence our democracy. Uh, it's it's super important. Obviously, during this time, APAC is rearing its head um, and, and really spending a lot of money. So for me, as somebody who's lived in, in places like Phoenix, building built up that credibility within that community, going back there, I didn't even ask anybody to do a fundraiser for us. And they and they said, we want to do something for you. And we raised $70,000 um, in that community just off of the goodwill of myself and my wife, who has also worked in refugee resettlement and really done a lot for the community over there. And then you have communities like Dallas, like LA, where I have family and they're willing to put themselves on the line and say, we believe in this cause. And, and many of the communities out there are very motivated by this factor as well. I don't think anybody during this time when you're seeing such graphic images that are taking place, um, you know, in, in Gaza, for example, in Sudan and so many other places, a lot of them want to to do something. So they feel motivated to, to use their dollars um, politically, uh, especially during 2024. And so, but uh, across the board, I mean, uh, people from all over the country, small dollar donations. I have a large following on Twitter, obviously. Some people even have donated from there. So it's just really heartwarming to see the amount of uh, outpouring that we've seen so far. Well, what's more important is what do the people in your district think and how are you getting support from them? Yeah, it's been really interesting. I've been door knocking, uh, especially these these past few days, and, and it's a very diverse district. It's not uh, the, the Seattle sort of uh, progressive bubble that, that maybe some people have in mind. It's actually historically been more of what you would call a purplish district. Um, it's shifting over time and it's becoming more and more diverse. But, you know, especially in, in the, you know, Muslim, South Asian, Asian communities, I think people are excited. They want because they see themselves in me like somebody who, who whose parents came from India in 1966, who wanted to just make a better life for the, for their children. And so they see their stories in myself. So it's it's really great from that standpoint. And then going to the voters, actually, and speaking to the voters, I think it's resonating with them. Um, I've I found, hardly found anybody who really resonates with the incumbent, to be quite frank. And it's not necessarily just to, to bash her, but I think it's important to note, especially in this political moment that we're in, that people are unhappy with just the situation in D.C. and they want to see fresh new ideas and faces in, in the political infrastructure. Let's talk about Gaza. Um, you, as well as uh, uh, us here at MPAC, called on President Biden to step down uh, and withdraw from the, the race. I think we did it back in November. We put it on uh, social media sometime earlier this year, uh, and you did the same. Uh, what was the initial reaction? To, uh, the initial reaction for us is, oh, you guys are crazy. How, how was the initial reaction to you? Yeah, I mean, I think here in Washington State, the uncommitted movement was really, I think it it took off. I think you obviously saw what happened in Michigan, and I was in some some uh, conversations with activists that, that took uh, part in the Michigan sort of movement. So I, I was almost you could say like somewhat of a catalyst behind the scenes for those conversations coming together. And there was only about eight days of lead time for organizing the uncommitted movement over here and over 90,000 people voted uncommitted. I, I wasn't organizing on the ground and all of that type of thing. Other people took it and they ran with it, but I think it speaks to sort of the larger, you know, sentiment that was taking place that's well, well over 10 percent you know 13 14 percent of washington's electorate and over 10 percent of cd8 so it speaks volumes as to like what people are feeling on the ground obviously they're i think from maybe the the establishment of the party people weren't necessarily ready for that but it's it just speaks to the times that we were in, the lack of responsiveness that was taking place, uh, there could have been a ceasefire in early October, to be quite frank. And we could, how many lives could we have saved if we would have gone down that path 
of diplomacy. Yeah. So I feel as though, um, you know, many people push back against that, but I think we saw the writing on the wall even at that time. Hubert Humphrey was the Democratic nominee um, in 1968, uh, ironically, in Chicago, just like uh, the Democratic convention will be in Chicago this year, uh, in 2024. Uh, that was after Lyndon Baines Johnson stepped down, just like J James Biden, um, uh, Joe Biden, sorry. Um, Joe Biden uh, stepped down this year. Um, but Hubert Humphrey did not really separate himself from the Johnson pro-war policy. What about Kamala Harris? Do you think she's going to make a distinction that uh, she is opposed to this war and, and for a ceasefire. She she had some speech, I think, in Selma where she kind of went out and said, you know, we need a ceasefire, and everybody started applauding. And then uh, 30 seconds later said, and in six weeks, you know, for six weeks so that we can allow humanitarian aid. Yeah. Um, where do you think she's going to end up? Because if, she, if she's going to be like Hubert Humphrey and not really show her any distinction uh, from Biden, then most people are going to say, well, what's the difference here? Yeah, I mean, I think she has to differentiate herself. I think part of at least the calculus as to why public opinion was shifting so much against uh, the current president is because of what was happening in Gaza and how, um, how you know, the American Muslim community and Arab community and people of conscience were uh, upset at, at what's happening. And for better or for worse, um, I think our vote does make a difference in this upcoming election, um, places like Michigan, Ohio, Georgia, um, Arizona, Texas, like where you have a substantial population of our community and they felt disaffected. And, and that speaks to a larger sort of political inefficacy that, that exists within society. So I think there are there's some things that we've heard today that maybe she's not going to take part in the Netanyahu sort of joint session in front of the Senate. Is that, you know, a sign of maybe positive things to come? Oh, we should, we should make it a positive thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Let's make it, let's make it a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So um, historically, I think she, she has not necessarily firmly planted herself on the right side of history on this issue. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's, it, it is a, a pivot point where she can start making those changes. We've seen it with members of Congress, sitting members of Congress that maybe a few years ago weren't that great on the issue, like Rohana, for example, but he's become much, much better on the yeah. issue. So I think understanding the shifting attitudes within society is going to be super important. So that's number one. Her stepdaughter is posted, you know, for Gaza, like a fundraiser on her Instagram. So maybe yeah. That could be somebody who could who could influence her her yeah. uh, you know so her policies with within the inside. So I'm hopeful a little bit. I think from the standpoint of Biden, he was sort of irredeemable to be quite frank. So my hope is that she'll at least like make a strong pivot on this issue and really work towards peace and not use sort of this Shakespearean language of you know a uh, humanitarian pauses and just resume the bombing six days later and so on and yeah. so. Forth. Um. Do you think Gaza is going to be an issue for your your campaign for October, the August sixth primary in uh, in Seattle, Washington? That's a, a tough question. Obviously, for me, it, it like I said, it's it's something that I think was was something that was a catalyzing force. Um, and I think the vast majority of people, when you talk to them on a one on one basis, they do they are disgusted by what they see. However, is that impacting? their end vote. For our communities, I think it, it's very, you know, visceral and upfront. However, with the vast majority of the electorate, I think they tying together the fact that our tax dollars are constantly being spent on just endless wars and where we don't have the infrastructure within our communities, like the affordable housing, um, the affordable education, and the affordable health care, um, especially in, in this district, there's a pronounced level of income inequality. The housing prices have gotten extremely out of control. Where somebody who works in the nonprofit field, like myself and yeah. my wife, like that, that's problematic. Uh, for somebody who's sending a a child to college this fall, like myself and my wife, that's that's a, a problem when it comes to the cost of education and the healthcare issue is just an ongoing thing. So, and we have schools that are closing. 
uh, in this district. So you go a few miles down the road and into other parts of the district, these, these federal tax dollars could easily be spent on things like infrastructure, affordable housing, and, and uh, the education aspect. So I think those types of things, once you start connecting the dots of, hey, our tax dollars don't have to go to endless bombing campaigns. Hey, we can tax the you know trillion dollar corporations within society at a fair rate and have a tax base where you can actually develop some of these things. I think that resonates more so and having somebody who, who understands that from an inside. The fact that I come from a business background as well, from a MBA background and that I've uh, run my own small business, I think that also resonates as well. So once you start like connecting the entire dots and like show you're, oh, you're not just a single issue candidate anymore, I think that is where it starts resonating. And what about November um, in, in the presidential election? Do you think guys will be uh, a factor uh, in terms of who's president? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah, it's obviously we'd hate to see Trump go back into office. I mean, you and I have both fought against the Muslim ban tooth and nail. We've fought against all of the horrific policies that have, have taken place. And so that is not something, you know, it's just almost like planning for like a, a hurricane that's going to hit your, your, you know, coastal area, your scenario planning for it, but that's not something that you want. So my hope is that I think people feel like disaffected during this time and people like may just feel a level of maybe this, you know, like where their vote is not going to count or like there's not somebody on the ballot who is necessarily going to represent them. So I think it's extremely important for somebody like, you know, Kamala Harris and whoever else is on the ticket with her from the Democratic side to really, you know, lean into the sentiments that existed, you know, understand the uncommitted campaign uh, and many of the other movements that have existed and, you know, that have taken place in America in these past few months are very serious and it's going to have implications on, people within these key states, um, it's it's undeniable. So we don't wanna you know, push all of that aside. Um, yes, there's definitely fundraising that's taking place and you know, there's a groundswell of, of support, but at the end of the day, you still have people who whose you know, core concerns are not addressed. You know, that's a really important point because uh, in 2016, Hillary Clinton could not generate audiences. Um, very, you know, it, it, we, they had to stage small rooms and pack them with people to make it look like uh, she had a crowd. Uh, Joe Biden was not generating much of an audience either in this campaign. Uh, they they had problems filling uh, auditoriums and they had to move partitions, you know, halfway uh, up so that it looked like it was a full hall, uh, and it was not. What do you think of Kamala Harris? Is she going to generate the crowd? Because if not, most, like you said, most people are just disaffected and they're just going to sit out. And if they sit out, then Trump wins. Yeah, I, especially with what we witnessed this last nine, 10 months, it's, it's a lot of people have been taken off of the board in terms of their potential for excitement. So I think, yes, like I said, there's there's a visceral excitement amongst her her core base that that is out there but in order to get that mass effect within everybody there is going to have to be uh, i think a pronounced shift in messaging and a you know a, a really major shift in terms of how they're approaching um this situation with Gaza um especially in our community i would say it's it's yeah uh you don't want people to just like sit sit on their hands and sit at home during the election but like the thing is that if people in their in their concerns are not heard, can you blame them really um, at, yeah. at a certain point? Or they're know? gonna go vote for Jill Stein. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or Dr. West or, yeah. or, or whatever, or like write something in and, you know, I if, mean, people are- if, <laughs> Yeah, it would be a shame if, if, if the West Stein votes, you know, uh, aggregated uh, reaches, um, uh, reach uh, over 10%. Uh, that means that the Democrats lost, um, you know, millions of voters uh, from their base. And right. uh, they will, you know, at some point, either now, it's it's either now or right after the election, there needs to be some in introspection in terms of what the Democratic Party really stands for, because I, I believe they're in an identity crisis. 
Yeah, I mean, you see, like, you know, especially in these resignations and like the whisperings that have like emanated these past nine months or so, you know, like the Tarek Habash and like a lot of these other, you know, Josh Pauls and the people of conscience, you you see that the undercurrent has existed there in in DC and within these administ within the administration, that there are people of conscience and people who want to stand up. Um, but now it's time to respond to those people of conscience. It can't just be an undercurrent anymore. It needs to be very overt. And it's it's not something that this country can uh necessarily endure to have somebody like Trump back in office uh, you know, for another four years. Uh we saw the damage. My wife, like I said, works in refugee resettlement and the amount of damage that he did to the refugee system here in the U.S. and the Im immigration system in the U.S., it's caused irreparable damage. And now if they're going to double down on these types of policies, it's going to be super, you know, super hurtful to the country moving forward. So how do you get people to, to care about this campaign? Like, you really need to listen to the people who've been dissenting, the people who've been on, you know, protesting. These are not just one-off people. This is a, a wide uh, uh, consortium of people that, that are standing up. Um, are you attending the Democratic National Convention? I am not. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I, I have people from my campaign who are who are delegates, uh, ceasefire delegates. So that that should be interesting. So they'll they'll be attending well, on my behalf. How, but, how many ceasefire delegates are there going from the state of Washington? That I know. I, I think that there's a good handful of them, at least like, you know, uh, eight to 10, I believe. What do you expect uh, at the convention? Um, you know, obviously the establishment and even I, to be honest, uh, just assume it's going to be Kamala Harris. Um, yeah. It, but uh, they also uh, are, are, are saying, well, you know, we want it to be, um, you know, full participation and we want to hear the people's voice. They can't have it both ways. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be Kamala. That's pretty obvious. My hope is that the delegates are able to gain some concessions, at least uh, within uh, the platform. I know that here in Washington, I, the fact that there was such a uh, a great turnout um, in terms of, you know, proceeds fire people, you know, they passed three resolutions within the state, uh, within the state Democratic Convention for, for ceasefire. And we, and it's, Reflective of the, you know, I think 70% of uh, Democrats are pro ceasefire. So I think at least from the standpoint of of pushing the, the needle forward, um, these folks are going to have an effect on what the end result and how the rhetoric is manifesting itself on a ground level. Yeah. yeah and Imran, we, we have about uh, uh, five more minutes here. Um, but as the conversation has been going, you know, you 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 mentioned your uh, your wife and her work early in the conversation. You also mentioned um, what's happened to some of her family in Gaza and, and that connection there. You've also talked about people of conscience. I, I wonder um, through your conversations with people there in Washington who who maybe don't know uh, a lot about the situation unfolding. How do we move someone from a person of indifference to a person of conscience? And and have you have you been using your personal story there? Have you found that very effective? I also imagine that's difficult sometimes, and it's very personal. And mm -hmm. so, how have you gone about that in, in helping people make that shift? Yeah, and just as a, a correction, it's my sister's husband, so um, that's I'm that's, that's a relation. But no, it's it's. I think it's, a lot of people assume that, but it's it's fine. Um, yeah, it, this, the point still stands. Um, you know, the the blood of Gaza is running through my my nieces and nephews' veins. You know, that is uh, when I look at them and I see the the pain that's in their eyes. It's it's really something that makes me want to stand up and and make a better world for them. This is the first time that you know some of them are going to be able to vote, and so it's it's really important uh, to make that that difference. But when you talk about you know people of indifference, I think we have to start looking beyond just this paradigm like you know in our religion for example we we're taught to not just think about like this this temporal temporal world and you know just sort of accumulating everything that we can and like curating it and making it nice of course you you want to have nice things you want to have nice vacations a nice home a nice 401k you want to have all of that type of thing but like 
look beyond sort of that, you know, just our, our little bubble and, and see how our actions impact the entire world. Um, and that is, I think, a larger component of, of what we're saying. Yes, Gaza is, is at the forefront of, of what we're talking about, but it can be anything really. It's, it's how maybe we were planting instability in, in other countries through sort of just this constant, I've, I've seen, you know, three decades of sort of this global war and terror now. And so how is this instability impacting us here back at home? How are our actions and our tax dollars just continuing to, to sort of manifest that? Why are people starving in places like Sudan and being, being displaced? And how can we uphold these types of governments that are arming sort of these genocidal uh, genocidal actions over there. And so tying everything back together, yes, we want to have a nice life and have, live in a nice neighborhood, but our tax dollars at the end of the day can be used for good. You know, our planet is being destroyed um, in a lot of different ways through a lot of manipulation and, and uh, you know, just abusing, abusing uh, the planet. We could be spending our money back here at home, uh, you know, making a better life for our kids. And, and also I think, you know, you talk about, and that's what we're really trying to do because I talk about this diverse district, 35% Asian American, for example. And like, I want to bring everybody under the tent. It's not just about Muslims, you know, people may try to paint me as the Muslim sort of candidate, but I want a society in a, in a reflection, you know, people elected officials, whether it's a school board, whether it's a, um, you know, state legislator or a city council member that's reflective of this broader society. So I want them to be able to see themselves and me and like potential for their own kids as well. So I think that's something we sort of, you know, try to tie in like, hey, this can be your kid. This can be like your nieces and nephews that are that are running the schools, that are running the uh, state law and so on and so forth. It's not just me. Uh, it's about a bigger uh, sort of tent that we're trying to create. Um. Last question to you. Uh, you know, we didn't really talk about your personal uh, life. Uh, what do you? What else do you do uh, besides campaigning? <laughs> yeah, I. You know, somebody who's you know coming from the business background. That's that's sort of been a defining factor. I mean, just a li little bit about myself. Sort of how I was thrust into this. My, uh, you know, my family actually started a, a, a wholesale jewelry business back in Atlanta, Georgia. I have an older brother. He's about 12 years older than me and an older sister. She's 10 years older than me. But my brother was the main sort of earner in the family. Um, he got into a horrible car accident um, when, you know, in 1999. Um, and I was sort of thrust in the position where I had to, you know, take care of the family and, and really sort of be the the person that that took care of them and the, their their young kids and everything. So um, that sort of thrust me into that into that trajectory of of trying to be in in the small business world and and so on and so forth. But on a positive note, thankfully my brother is, is you know healed and and able to you know he looks normal now and is is doing fine. And his son is actually twenty six years later is now my campaign manager for for uh, my congressional run. So it's a cool little full circle run. But um, yeah, in terms of just other stuff, I. I like to get out there and hike with the family and explore the Pacific Northwest. Since moving here, we've gone all over the the map and doing all that type of stuff. And of course, I'm a avid basketball player as well. Uh, not as much anymore uh, as I, as I continue to age, but try to you know yeah. keep my feet on this. So, do you want the uh, Seattle SuperSonics to come back? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, growing up in Atlanta, I'm a Hawks fan. That's you know a tortured soul, but you know I want the Sonics to come back here. Um, I think that'll be you know, something, there's a huge basketball culture over here. So many players that have gone to the NBA locally here from Seattle. So it's an injustice that there's no Seattle uh, NBA team. So we definitely how, tall are, how tall are you? Oh, I'm only 5'10", so I'm a three-point shooter. So, okay. you know. well, Oh, okay. You got the shot. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's that's today's NBA. It's it's yeah. all about the three-point shot. Yeah, I was ahead of my time. So, yeah. you know. Nobody cares about defense. Just make that three-point shot and you, you're, you're good. Exactly. So all right. Thank you. Hey, it was great talking to you. Good luck. And yeah. and, and uh, uh, we really look forward to seeing your name up there as one of the top two uh, for uh, after after April 6th for the November election. So we'll talk yeah. again. Yeah, inshallah. All right. Thank yeah. you. August 6th. Did I say April? I, oh, yeah. I'm mixing up so much stuff. I'm sorry. There's just too many things happening. August <laughs> 6th is your primary election. 
let's let's take uh, well, let's talk after that and hopefully we'll we'll talk some more about the november elections yep we'll all do. right thank you yes. take care assalamu alaikum